Well, we are so excited to announce something brand new here at Bayshore Community Church. Available now on any of the app stores, either Apple or Android or even Amazon, is the exciting Bayshore Church app for your mobile device. Now, this app is chock full of content for you to use to engage with Bayshore. There's a sermon archive where you can browse past messages from both campuses. There's ways for you to sign up for classes, for events, for small groups. There's events calendars so that you don't miss anything that's happening. There's even a Bible reading section where you can get daily updates on where we are reading in the Bible. Also, this app has a great new giving feature, a very sleek and efficient way to easily give anytime you like and also have reoccurring gifts. So be sure to check out our app. You can go to bayshorecc.org slash app. That's bayshorecc.org slash A-P-P. And find links to download the Bayshore Church app. Well, uh, Rhett and Denise Parsons, I love that story. Love hearing people's stories about giving and uh, what that means to them and their journey in giving. I think that when you think about Giving, it's, giving is always a journey, learning to give, learning to grow in that part of your life. And I uh, just love hearing uh, about Denise and Rhett Parsons, who've been here at Bayshore for so long, and their story about when they started giving. I remember that Sunday we needed the lawnmower. I remember that's just a big deal for us and uh, how the Lord provided for that. And it was sitting in the, uh, the driveway the next week that happened. So a cool thing. Well, this is uh, part four, and this is the last Sunday of our of our giving series on famous givers, and uh, you guys have been so encouraging during this uh, series, and uh, just so glad that you were here for all of this. So here's what uh, we're going to look at today. We're going to look at uh, one of the famous givers in the Bible, a great, great story that is very familiar to us uh, about a famous gift, and it's found in uh, John chapter 6, verses 1 through 13, story that I learned in Sunday school, story that I know you learned in Sunday school. But it's just an incredible story about uh, a little boy who gave his lunch. And now Jesus took the little that he had and turned it into a whole lot. So here's here's the story. It's actually found in all four Gospels, but we're going to read John's version of that. John chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up from a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered, eight months' wages could not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. And how far would they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There is plenty of grass in that place. And the people sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather up the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Now this is a a famous story. Now when the uh, Bible was composed and the apostles who witnessed the things that Jesus did They had all of these stories about Jesus, all these things that he did. In fact, John said if if everything was recorded that Jesus did, all the books in in the world couldn't contain the information about what Jesus did and what he accomplished. But when they had all of these stories to tell about Jesus, you know, Matthew, the tax collector, Mark, who was actually a, a friend of Peter, and Peter, Mark is actually Peter's gospel, where Peter tells his story of viewing Jesus. Then you've got Luke, the friend of Paul, uh, and then you've got John. When all of these apostles uh, comprise their story about Jesus, none of them left out this story. This was a very, very important story to them. And uh, 
it's ironic that John included it because John usually uh, has all different material than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke have. Uh, actually, 80 to 85 percent of the Gospel of John is new material about Jesus, different than what's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But even John included this because this story had an impact on them. And so every single gospel has the feeding of the 5,000. Now, I think it has to do with the impact it had on the disciples. They were actually involved, hands-on involved, no pun intended, hands-on involved, just holding and handling the bread and fish that multiplied to feed the, the multitude. Now, I think if you have bread and fish in your hand that multiplies, it leaves an impression on you. And so when they were putting together the stories of Jesus, they didn't leave this out because it was such a big deal for them. Now, it happened uh, on the Sea of Galilee. I've been to kind of where it was. Sea of Galilee, if you know that sea, it's in, uh, in the Holy Land. It's uh, 13 miles long, 8 miles wide, shaped like a heart, harp. It's uh, called in the Old Testament the Sea of Chinnereth, and Chinnereth means harp. And the Sea of Galilee is shaped like a harp. But it was named different things. It was called the Sea of Tiberias because in A.D. 20, uh, there was a, a famous city built there that's still there called Tiberias, which was named after the emperor. But it's mainly known to us as the Sea of Galilee. And it was on the, uh, it was on the uh, eastern side of that lake uh, in a mountainous region. Most of the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by mountains, except for the southern part. And on the, sort of on the northwestern side is a little place called Bethsaida, and that's where Philip is from. And that's why in the story, Jesus asked Philip, where shall we get food to feed these people? Now, the, probably the reason he asked Philip was, Philip was, he knew where the restaurants were because he lived there. And so this is where the miracle happened. And it also happened at, a, at an interesting time. It happened, uh, it actually wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, according to uh, where the disciples were mentally. They had just been on a, a, they had been in a ministry where they had been ministering. Jesus had sent them out around Galilee, and so they had been ministering. And after they had been ministering, they came back. They were all excited, and Jesus said, okay, you've been working hard. Let's come apart and rest for a while. And so that was what led up to the miracle. The disciples were going to the mountains to rest. And Another thing had happened. John the Baptist had just been beheaded. And Jesus had heard about John the Baptist being beheaded. And so he was, uh, and it says, when Jesus heard that John the Baptist was beheaded, he departed. And so the disciples are in grief. They're weary. But the people hear that they're there, and they all come to see Jesus. And he heals them, and he ministers to them. And at this sort of low moment... In the lives of the disciples, John the Baptist is just beheaded. They're emotionally kind of drained. These people come with demands. And Jesus ministers to the people, and he teaches them. He heals them. He has a wonderful time. And I think he lets the disciples kind of hang out and, and, and lay on the, on, the, on, the, on the ground and kind of rest. And then he, he, as the day wears on, he says to them, let's feed these people. And they say, eight months' wages is what some texts say. Eight months' wages would not be enough to feed all these people. We need to send them away. And Jesus presses the issue, and he says, you feed the people. So here is the story's big idea. The story's big idea is, is there is a need in front of them that's bigger than the resources they have. There is a need in front of them that's bigger than the resources they have. When you compare what they need and what they have, there's a deficit. Now that is the story. The story is basically about a demand and supply. There's not enough supply to meet the demand. And so Jesus uses that incident to teach them about his infinite ability to meet their needs. There has to be, in our journey, people that, us that follow Jesus, and if you're new and you're not a 
Christ follower. Here's part of what it means to be a Jesus follower. It means to live your life recognizing that you are a finite resource that needs God's infinite power to help you. You are a finite resource that needs God's infinite power to help you. Now, it just may not, it just could be more things than money. It can be sometimes just emotionally you are drained. I remember when I was in Israel, uh, I think it was about 10 years ago, when I went to Israel, I was, uh, I was around Bethsaida. I went with a group of about 80 people, most of them from California. Jack Hayford, who was a famous uh, communicator, uh, was the leader of the group. And uh, we're sitting around Bethsaida where this miracle happened. And there's a pool there, kind of a, you know, like a, a, a pool in the middle with a little uh, colonnade around it. We're all sitting around it. There's some shade trees around. And uh, Jack Hayford's wife, Anna, is talking about this story. And she said she told of a time about five years before this when they had come to Israel one year in November. It had been Thanksgiving. She had all these people at her house and they just had a loss in the family. Somebody had died. And she came to Israel with her husband, Jack, to lead this group. And she said when she got to Israel, she was absolutely emotionally drained. And she had 80 people that she was supposed to take care of and minister to. And she said, I just didn't have enough. And the Lord spoke to her out of this story. That when your strength is limited, God's strength is unlimited. God is a God who is infinite and we are finite in everything about us. Everything about humans are finite. We have a finite amount of money. How many have a limited amount of money? Just raise your hand if that's true for you. You have a finite amount of money. Everybody does. Let me just, I don't want to insult your intelligence, but how many here, you have a finite, you have a finite uh, sense of intelligence. You, you don't know everything. How many don't know everything? Unless you're a teenager. If you're a teenager, you know everything. <laughs> I remember my dad saying to me, son, you know everything. You know, I, and I did when I was 17. Now I don't know anything. We have finite energy. We have finite intelligence. We have finite resources. We have finite motivation. Everything about us is finite. It's limited. But everything about God is infinite. He's infinite. There is no deficit with God. He always has more than is ever needed. Now, I was thinking about this illustration. Here's a... uh, a goblet here, and this is, uh, just want you to know, this is grape juice, uh, non-fermented, so just if you're worrying, if you, know, if, it, if you are stressing me out a little bit, you know, maybe I'm drinking a little bit while I'm preaching, that's not it, that's not what's going on here. This is just grape juice, and this grape juice is in, I think this goblet is a, probably maybe a 10-ounce goblet, and this represents This represents the finite capacity of human beings. We always have a finite capacity. We always have, we have something, but we don't have something that's infinite. So when you think about you and you think about the person next to you and you think about yourself, always remember that you are a finite resource. That's important for us to know. God is infinite, unlimited, and you are limited. This story says they had something, they had limited resources, and they had a need in front of them that was bigger than their need, and bigger than their resources. Now you think about, think about it this way. Okay, this is, this is you. This is me. You know, limited. And... Uh, when you think about God, God's more like Lake Tahoe, but that's not a good illustration. Lake Tahoe, do you know Lake Tahoe? Here's a picture of Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe is the eighth deepest uh, lake in the world. At one point, it's, uh, its deepest point's 1,645 feet deep. Now, if you were to tip over Lake Tahoe, tip it over, it would cover the whole state of California with 14.5 inches of water. 
if you were to take the water in Lake Tahoe, there's enough water in Lake Tahoe to pr- supply 50 gallons of water a day for every person in the United States for five years. I mean, that's a lot of water. Slightly bigger than Trap Pond. <laughs> Let's face it, Trap Pond is, exp- is, is impressive, but not this impressive. But do you know that Lake Tahoe, some of you have been to maybe to Lake Tahoe, do you know that Lake Tahoe is 120 times smaller than Lake Superior? So when you think of God's resources, think bigger. God's resources are always infinite, and our resources are finite. So that's what, that's what Gibbon's about. Gibbon's about recognizing that I am a finite resource leaning on an infinite God, and when something is in front of me that is bigger than my personal resources, I can take my limited resources and put my limited resources in the hand of an infinite God who can take what is not enough and make it enough. Now, for me, this is our story, Karen and I's story. I think this is Rhett and Denise's story. My story was when we didn't have enough. And we faithfully worked. We faithfully paid our bills. I faithfully got more education. I faithfully did what I knew to do. But in the midst of that, I constantly put my limited resources in the hands of an unlimited God who made what was not enough more than enough. And that's what this story teaches. He can take what is not enough and make it enough. In fact, I believe that sometimes God puts us in places where we don't have enough in order for us to trust Him In fact, I I think this is the whole reason this miracle is recorded in the New Testament. I think that's the reason it happened. Jesus asked Philip to test him. This was a test. This was a teaching moment for the disciples because throughout their lives they would be in places where they did not have enough and their need in front of them would outrun what they had. When I came here 36 years ago, I did not have enough intelligence. I did not have enough experience. I did not have enough education. I did not have what I needed. I came here with three sermons, and they weren't that good. But I learned week by week, faced with things that were bigger than me, that when I take what is not enough, and I place it in the hands of a God who always has enough, He can take my thing that's not enough, and He can pour His infinite grace on it and make it more than enough. So that's what this story is about. It's about recognizing the infinite, powerful hands of the Almighty God. Say this with me. I am finite. I have finite money, finite intelligence, finite energy. But thank God, I am connected to an infinite God. So, the big idea of the story is this. Faced with resources, or faced with the need, It's greater than the resources. There's a gap between the need and the resources. God fills the gap between the need and the resources. That's what the story teaches. Then Jesus takes the the barley loaves, and if you read the story, if you study the story, barley barley loaves was the food of the poor. This is not this is this is white bread. This is not multi-grain bread. This is not the four dollar loaves of bread that you buy. This is the cheap bread. Barley loaves, barley was the, the was the cheapest 
bread you could eat in those days. I mean, it was for poor people. So he takes the, takes the barley loaves, there's five of them, and, the, and you, when you say loaves, when we say loaves, you're, you're thinking food lion, Harris Teeter loaves. We're talking, we're talking little biscuits, not very big. And we're talking about two fish, pickled fish probably. So Jesus takes, they, they said, you know, who do you, you know, what, what, what do we have? This is an important part of the story. What do we have? This is always throughout the Bible when there's a miracle, there's always something that you have that's used. So what do you have? And they, you know, they found the little boy and the little boy gave his lunch. And that's the story we learned in Sunday school. How many learned that story in Sunday school? The little boy gave his lunch. Isn't that great? It's great. And here's, here's an important part of giving, though, by the way. And I've been trying to stress this throughout the whole series because I know how, you know, series on giving can be to people. And uh, I don't think they held that little boy down and the disciples stole his lunch. I don't think that happened. I think he gave it freely. And that's a part of giving. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, each man should give what he decided in his heart to give. Giving flows out of the voluntary uh, overflow of your heart. And that's an important part. But Jesus takes, he takes the, the bread <clears throat> and he takes the fish and he lifts it up before his father and he gives thanks. What does he give thanks for? It's specific in the text. He gives thanks for the bread and the fish. He gives thanks for what they have. He does not lament what they don't have. He gives thanks thanks for what they do have. And here's an important principle. Listen to this. Miracles always happen in an atmosphere of gratitude. Miracles always happen in an atmosphere of gratitude. It's when we are not grateful, it's when we're complaining, it's when we're whining, it's when things aren't, we don't like the way things are, that miracles are stymied in our life. It's when we become grateful and honoring of God that we thank Him for what we have. Maybe we don't have the job we want. Maybe we don't live in the house we want to live in ultimately. Maybe we, but we're grateful and overflowing with gratitude with what we have. Being grateful for what you have. And I tweeted this week, I said, uh, I said, when you are obsessed with what you want, it blinds you from what you already have. How many already have some wonderful things in your life? Can you say big amen? How many already have some money in your, in your life? How many already have something in your life? This is why I grew a, a little beard. You know, I have some hair. Thank the Lord. But Jesus was grateful for what he had, and out of that gratitude, miracles happened. And you know, if you want to, how, how many are you going to plant? How many are going to like to grow tomatoes? Anybody like to grow tomatoes? And you have, you know, I mean, there's something about buying those store bought tomatoes. You know, those things that are strip mined down in Texas. You know, there's a, you know, but but real tomatoes. How many love real tomatoes? I mean, you know, those things that are just not styrofoam with tomato flavoring. I mean, real tomatoes. You know, you're going to be planting tomato plants in a little while. But what if? In January, you planted tomato plants in your yard. I mean, no, if you plant tomato plants in January, you're not going to get tomatoes because it's not the right atmosphere in order to get tomatoes. There has to be the right atmosphere. The right atmosphere to see miracles and see God do things in your life is a gratitude, an atmosphere of gratitude, an atmosphere of thanksgiving, an attitude of gratitude because when we are thankful, this story teaches us that out of thankfulness for what you have, God gives you more. 
out of thankfulness for what he's blessed you with, God expands what you have. We're, we're always so goal-oriented, and I, I, so, I so get that. You know, I'm, I'm wired that way. We're always reaching for the next thing. We're always like, okay, we got this house, but what's next? That's, there's something good about that, but there's also something that be, can become problematic for us in that. We just need to stop and say, Lord, I thank you for what I have. I read this week about this guy uh, here's a picture of this guy named Ada, Ada Adlers. This is Ada Adlers. He worked for 45 years for a school in Louisiana. And uh, he was, what he did was he was a uh, supervisor for uh, expelled kids who were expelled, expelled in the school. But for 45 years, he had this little habit. Every time he would see a penny on the ground, he would pick it up and he would save it. 45 years he did that. He retired, I think it was in 2013. He had every penny he had picked up, every penny he had picked up for 45 years, he put in these jugs, and he had, uh, uh, he had I think it was 15 five-gallon jugs full of pennies. Took them to the bank, and the bank was thrilled to see all these pennies. And they, you know, poured in those machines. It took five hours, five hours to process those pennies. And at the end of it being processed, he had $5,136.14 from picking up pennies for, for 45 years. And here's, here's the interesting part of the story. This man, Adam Adler's, He said, here was his philosophy of life. He said, every time he saw a penny on the ground, he used that as a trigger to thank God for God's goodness in his life. And for 45 years, every time he saw a penny on the ground, he said, that's God reminding me to be thankful. And he said, some days I'd be in a bad mood or whatever. And he said, God would put in my path a penny that was dropped on the ground. I would pick that up and that would be God's reminder to be thankful. And I believe that as we come through this whole idea about giving and resources, one of the principles in this story is that we need to become a person are persons that learn to have an eye for gratitude. An eye for gratitude. How many here this morning, you got some amazing things to be thankful for? you got some amazing things to be thankful for. I've got some amazing things to be thankful for. I've got, look at you, you guys are just a wonderful, wonderful church. What, 9 o'clock in the morning, all you people are here listening to me teach. I'm just thankful for that. I remember years ago when, when uh, Karen and I first came here, and, uh, I, you know, in three months, I was able to whittle the congregation down two-thirds, you know. We had started with 60, ended up with 20, and most of them were my family, and they were thinking about going to another church. I'm telling you, it was bad. And everybody, it's funny, everybody went to the Wesleyan church down the road. They went to the little Wesleyan church down the road, and uh, my office had to be on that side. I'd be getting ready for church, and I'd look out the window, and I'd see all the cars used to be in this parking lot at the church next door. And so they were all, they all left, and so I'm here with 20 people and my kids and uh, my wife and and I remember how, how, how I, I just felt so bad. I just felt like, I felt like loser. And you know what the Lord said to me in the midst of that? He said, look in front of you. Look at who is with you. Be thankful for those 20 people. Love those 20 people. Pour your life into those 20 people. And you know what? As I did that, those 20 people became 40 people, and those 40 people became 100 people, and the Lord blessed that because there's something about focusing on what you already have and giving thanks for that. Hey, listen, why don't we take a little commercial break right now? Here's our commercial break in the service. Why don't you lift your hands right now? Lift your hands, the Lord. What do you got to thank the Lord for? Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for my business. Thank you, Lord, for my truck. Thank you, Lord, 
for my this or that. Thank the Lord for the money you have. You wish you had a raise. You wish you had a better, uh, maybe more opportunities. You had more uh, houses to build. But thank God for the houses you're building right now. Thank God for the stuff you're doing right now. Give thanks for your loaves and fishes. And in the environment of gratitude, miracles begin to happen. So Lord, fill our hearts with gratitude and thanksgiving for what you're doing. And everybody said a big amen and amen. I am so tempted to tell the story, I'm just going to tell it. And you all have heard it. I hate to tell reruns. And I know people, there's probably people in this, this service that have heard this story 10 times, 15 times. Red's heard it 20 times. But some of you are new here and you've never heard this story, so I don't want to deprive you. There was this guy, a guy named Brother Benjamin. Brother Benjamin... You know, he was a Catholic, and he wanted to get real serious about following the Lord and, and all that, so he joined this monastery. He's one of those monasteries where, you know, you weren't allowed to talk, and except once a year he got to say two words. And so at the end of the first year, the bishop brought him in and said, Brother Benjamin, how's everything going for you here? What would you like to say? You get to say two words. Now he said, food bad, food bad. Oh, okay, Brother Benjamin, we'll write it down, food bad, food bad. He went and served another year, and at the end of that year, he got to say two more words. The bishop said, what do you want to say now? He said, bed hard. Bed hard. Okay, Brother Benjamin wrote it down, put it in his file. Third year, he was called in, and the bishop said, uh, you get to say two more, your, two more words. What do you want to say? He said, I quit. I quit. <laughs> bishop said, it doesn't surprise me. You've done nothing but complain the whole time you've been here. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. I got that off my chest, so I'm glad you enjoyed that. <laughs> Say this with me. God only does miracles in an atmosphere of gratitude. So, not enough resources to meet the demand. Gave thanks. And then, pick up 12 baskets full. Pick up 12 baskets full. They picked up what was not what was not used, what was not wasted. Here's the cool part of the story. They picked up what was left over, and I love that, that God is a God that gives you more than you need. Not just what you need, but He gives you more than you need in this story. Pick up what's left over. Let it not be wasted. Don't waste the miracle. So pick up. What's left over? Twelve baskets full. Twelve baskets. Why twelve? I have no idea. Twelve baskets. Who got the baskets? I don't know. I mean, I would like to think the little boy got the baskets. And he's bringing them home at night, you know, telling that story to his mom. You know, he's got all these baskets. But, I, you know, maybe it was each for the disciples. A lot of the commentaries say the number twelve represents the twelve tribes of Israel. So this was a symbolic miracle that, you know, God's going to meet the needs of all his people. But the big point of the story was, pick up the 12 baskets, look at the evidence, and be reminded of what God did today. Look at the evidence of what God did today. Don't forget what God did for you. And here's what a wasted miracle is. A wasted miracle is a forgotten miracle. A wasted miracle is a forgotten miracle. When you forget what God has done for you, you've wasted a miracle. I was standing in Starbucks this week in line, and there was a pastor who came up behind me, and he bought my coffee for me, which makes me love him so much. I mean, I had plenty on my gold card, but he bought my coffee, so who's going to argue? You know, praise God. I said, I'll take a sticky bun too. I'll, you know, a couple of things. So. He said, hey, he told me the story. I knew God had just done something amazing for his church. He got five acres given him, five acres of land in a very prestigious area. Five acres. And a uh, guy just, their church needed some, needed to build a church. And, and uh, he's, 
God gave him five acres. I said, I said, listen, that's amazing. Tell me the story. Tell me how it happened. I looked at him and I said, you better write this down. You better write it down and you better rehearse this with your church 10 years from now. Because whenever God does something amazing for you, you need to make sure that you document that miracle and let it be fodder for faith for the future. When the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River, Joshua said, go back in the river, get 12 stones, bring them out, pile them up, make a memorial. And when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? You'll tell them that this was when the Lord took us across the Jordan River. We always have to get the 12 baskets. We always have to remember what God has done for us and through us. How many have got some things God's done for you? I could be here the next three hours telling you stuff God's did for me. Think about my, I was talking to the, someone this morning that they just had a, a, in their family a preemie, a baby born, and how the Lord's taken care of that. And I remember when my little son, Tim, was born three weeks early, ingesting fluid, looks like he was going to die. The, the doctors prepared us for maybe this baby wouldn't live, and we prayed. And, and uh, you know, God is mysterious. He does all kinds of things, and it's not the answer to everything, but God healed my son and touched him and made him well and he's strong and yesterday he called me I hit a deer a lot of you know I hit a deer with my car the other night and uh, ruined my little Honda car and uh, the deer's not doing too good either so anyhow <laughs> my son Tim called me when the house doing you know my son my little baby that was not going to live called him to check on his daddy Hey, how many baskets do you have full of provision from God? Don't let it be wasted. Pick them up and gather them. I'm going to close with uh, this series with this story, and I'm a little bit over time. I'm usually a 30-minute preacher. I'm a 35-minute preacher, probably 37 minutes today. So uh, here we go. Final story. I, I, I read this this week, and I'm just going to read it. I don't like to read things, but this is such a good story. It's an article entitled, Former Alcoholic Donates His First Paycheck to God. Make that a little bigger. There you go. Craig C. has been an alcoholic for more than a dozen years. He lost everything he had, including his wife and son, due to his selfish, selfishness and addiction. Things began to change after he gave his life to Christ, but he still fell regularly into his old habits. It didn't help that he had lost his well-paying job and was clerking at a local grocery store that was well-stocked with all his favorite drinks. After a few years of going back and forth between Christ and the bottle, he finally cut the ties and, out of obedience to Christ, quit his job. With no income and hope only in Christ, he was in a desperate condition. After an interview with a sheet metal company, sheet metal company down the street from his new church, he cried out to God, God, if you give me this job, I will give you my first paycheck. Surprisingly, he got the job. He clearly remembers the day when he got his first paycheck. Stacks of bills needed to be paid. Penniless, he determined, penniless but determined, he endorsed it over to the church and walked to the church office without waiting for the Sunday offering. This was the moment, he says, that changed his life because now he understood what it meant to trust God. As of today... Craig has been sober for 25 years. He's a manager at that sheet metal company, and he serves as an elder at his local church. I think that's a good story. It's a good story. Let's lift our hands to the Lord this morning, and let's say, God, you are an unlimited resource for the demands in front of me. Say this with me. God, you are an unlimited resource for the demands that are in front of me. Now, Lord, as we conclude this series, we're thankful that your Holy Spirit has spoken to us as a church. We ask you, Lord, to pour out your amazing grace on us today, to pour out your love on us. And, Lord, we thank you that we go into a world today. We go into a future with our hands held by the hands of an infinite God. 
you are infinite. You are unlimited. And so, Lord God, we place our limitedness in your hands, and we thank you for taking care of us and blessing us in the future. And everybody said amen and amen.